morning, everyone. This is Bill Miles with the Hilton Head Island Bluffton Chamber of Commerce, and uh, like to welcome you to our final Teletown Hall call for 2020. And you know, it's hard to believe that uh, since the pandemic started, this is our 39th call. And uh, want to recognize all of you and thank you for for listening each and every week. And then also our partnership with the Beaufort County Channel that allows us to uh, certainly expand the listening reach. You know, we're uh, going to end the year on a high note with a great lineup today of thought leaders with several special guests with us. And uh, from your chamber's point of view, we are looking forward to uh, winding down 2020 and then certainly excited about moving on into a very, very positive new year. Some great things on the horizon. And also here at the chamber, we'll have some new programs and initiatives that we're going to be rolling out to our members as well as the entire community. Uh, at the begin beginning of uh, next year in 2021. As we turn that chapter today, I thought on the final town hall that uh, it'd be great if uh, we could welcome back our governor, Henry McMaster, with us again. And Governor McMaster has been on other town town halls before, and I know he's got a few special words that uh, he wants to share with our listeners today. And Governor, we're delighted to have you with us. Thanks for making time out for a few minutes here to uh, talk to the listeners here at Hilton Head Island, Bluffton, and Beaufort County. Are you there, Governor? We're uh, connecting with the Governor here, so it may just be another another minute or two uh, before the Governor is able to join in. But uh, well, Governor, can you hear me? All right. While we uh, pause the governor for a moment, we're gonna we're gonna move on here for a minute until uh, we're able to for him to join. But uh, with that said, we're gonna move forward with our next guest, and we'll circle back to the governor uh, when he comes on. But our next guest, uh, uh, we're delighted to have as well, and that is Beaufort County Treasurer Maria Walls. And Maria is a certified public accountant. She won her current office and. 2014 after serving four years as the deputy treasurer. I think it's important to note that uh, in 2015, which was her first year in office, she was named the office holder of the year by Thomas and Reuters for having achieved excellence in planning, leadership, and service in Beaufort County. And um, uh, we know there's a lot going on at the county level. And on Monday, December 7th, the Beaufort County Council approved uh, a request brought forward by Maria and her office uh, to accept prepayments for the 2020 real and personal property taxes for the year of 2020. And with that said, uh, Maria, thank you for joining us today. And uh, we appreciate the work that you do every day and looking forward to an update on, on prepayments and other things that you'd like to address. Thank you so much, Mr. Miles, and to all the members who are joining this morning. I see some of you and familiar faces, so good morning. So yes, there is a lot going on at the county and it seems in government in general lately. So let's get started. Um, I am open to questions and I'm not familiar with your <laughs> process for asking them. So please jump in or whatever is um, normal for these meetings. So let's start with first the prepayment um, of taxes and what the viewers and your members need to know. As I think we all understand the 2020 annual tax bills have not been sent yet. It, it, in the past month, the Beaufort County Auditor's Office um, received a court order requiring that they recalculate the 2020 bills that he had previously created. Now, at the Treasurer's Office, we don't determine the amount of taxes that are due from our customers we disperse a bill and collect what the auditor tells us to. So we were in a little bit of a predicament because we do have so many customers that want to pay now, especially those who itemize their income tax deductions. They wanna pay before December 31st. So we'd love to take the payment. We didn't have a bill yet that was recalculated from the auditor's office to apply those payments to. So last Monday, as Mr. Miles shared, Beaufort County Council passed a resolution approving and requesting that the treasurer's office begin taking what we are calling prepayment. And what this is, 
is essentially us communicating or making available to our customers the original amount that was calculated by the auditor. So it's not an estimate. It's not an arbitrary number determined by our office. It is the original dollar amount that the auditor's office provided to us. Now, it is a prepayment based on that amount. So this is optional. It, if anybody listening gets one thing, know that this is not required. This is, we created this opportunity because we don't want our customers to miss out on any tax deductions or anything else. Now, that is for our customers who um, want to choose to pay early. For everyone listening who has a mortgage and pays their property taxes through their escrow account, this will be done for you. We are in communication almost daily with our major tax processors. So if you're not sure how mortgage companies work as far as tax payments is concerned, you probably already saw the payment for your taxes taken out of your escrow. That doesn't mean that the treasurer's office has that payment. Most of the large lenders, especially lenders like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, they, or, and Chase, they're going to hire what is called a tax processor. And it's essentially a middle person between the lender and the, and the tax collector. So this happens all over the country. What they're going to do is they take the money, your bank will remove the money from your escrow account and give it to this third party vendor. That's actually who the treasurer's office works with. That third party has those funds at this time. It's our understanding in our communications with them that they are simply waiting for us to open this prepayment opportunity on December 18th, and they are prepared to make all of the tax payments that they have received from their client's escrow account. So this will happen if you pay by escrow automatically. Now, does this affect vehicles? Now, prepayment doesn't affect vehicles, but the situation that we've been experiencing in the county over the past month does affect vehicles. And I bet a lot of the members listening have had that happen to them. As the auditor's office is recalculating the 2020 tax bill, it is taking up a lot of the IT resources of not just our software, but the county servers. And unfortunately, that has prevented us from updating our online payment system, My Beaufort County. It, the county was trying to make every effort necessary to help the auditor comply with the court order in a timely manner. And not updating the online system was unfortunately one of the things that got delayed. It is now updated. We are doing that at least weekly with an agreement between the county and the auditor because the auditor's process does need to stop while that update is occurring. It is just a very, very massive file. So that happened last Friday and it will happen every Friday until hopefully we can resume our normal business operations, which would be to update it daily. So this does affect vehicles in, in, a, round, in a kind of side way, but as far as prepayments are concerned, it doesn't affect it directly. In, please be aware that for your vehicle, you can always mail your payment, and we honor the postmark date. So, okay. So what to know if you're going to prepay? So like I said, if you're paying your taxes with your mortgage company, you are, you are okay there. So now if you want to pay as an individual, we are strongly encouraging our customers to use MyBeaufortCounty.com. As I mentioned, it is being updated now, whereas a few weeks ago it was not. It is being updated now, and it is current. It will be available. The 2020 taxes will be available starting Friday morning, December 18th. So that's this Friday. You simply go on there, and you can pay your the balance due. Sign up for e-billing if you would like to. And please keep in mind that if you pay with a check, there are absolutely no additional fees. Whereas if you do pay by a credit card, there is a convenience fee that's charged for processing that payment. I know that not all of our customers are comfortable using online payments. So we are able to accept mail payments at our Buford office. 
And I do want our customers to be aware that they will not get a receipt right away for a mailed in payment. But the benefit of my Beaufort County is one, you are helping our staff be more efficient and not having to process those manual payments. So we really would appreciate that partnership and our customers using my Beaufort County if they're going to prepay. It gives us a better paper trail and you will get a receipt right away. And that's ultimately what this is about. We want our customers to be able to pay before December 31st, have their receipt and know that they've taken care of their business and there's nothing else that needs to be done. Regardless of how you pay, whether you want to use my Beaver County or you mail in your payment, we will do everything we can to honor the intended date our customers wanted to pay. So if you mailed your payment, we will honor the postmark date on your envelope. And obviously, if you pay online, we have a date and time stamp for that. Because at the end of the day, again, it's about allowing people the ability to pay before December 31st, and we will honor the date our customers intended to pay. Um, and I apologize, I have that bullet uh, duplicated, so we already discussed vehicles. So get to know by Beaufort County if you haven't already. Um, we have a great how-to video and tutorial on our website if you would like to just get familiar with it without having to create an account or use it. You can use it as a guest and you don't need to create an account. It really is a system that we created to put the choice in the customer's hands. You can use it as a guest, use it as an account holder, save your payment information, not save your payment information. You can get a paper bill and still use it, or you can get an email and still mail your payment. It is entirely up to our, what our customers feel comfortable with. But it is very simple. And on Friday, if you want to prepay, you can go to myviewforcounty.com. You're going to look up your bill, and you can do that with your last name and mailing address or business name. Pay the amount due, and you're going to get a receipt. And as far as our customers are concerned, you should be finished with what you need to do. On our end in the treasurer's office, what will happen is your funds will be deposited as they normally would, same procedures. It's the payment recognition that will have to wait until the auditor's office is completed. And in theory, if the original amount billed by the auditor was higher than what is being recalculated now, which is what is occurring, in theory, all of our customers should be receiving a small refund. And again, if you have a mortgage company paying, that little refund will go back to your mortgage company and ultimately be deposited into your escrow account. So you don't have to worry about that. So what's next? Whether you prepay or not, you are still going to get a bill. Why? It's required by law. We have to communicate the amount that you were, that you were to pay in taxes in the form of a bill. So it seems a little backwards. And it is a little backwards that we're providing a receipt before you've received an official bill document. But unfortunately, that's the situation we're finding ourselves in and we're doing everything we can to just make it work for everyone. The payment deadline will be extended again. Currently, um, the Department of Revenue had or previously approved a due date of the bills when they are mailed to February 15th. We have now asked for an additional extension to April 1st due to the amount of time this recalculation is taking. Again, that's not because we're not anxious to begin collecting. It's because we don't want, we, we want to minimize the effect this is having on our customers as much as possible. And it certainly wouldn't be appropriate to keep a January 15th payment deadline or even February 15th payment deadline and only give our customers a few weeks to pay potentially a very large tax bill in some cases. So we wanna make sure there's equity in the amount of time our customers have to pay. So those, the payment deadline is being extended. Okay, so the benefits. Um, I, I saw some town uh, members of the town on the call and, and ultimately from a, a government entity standpoint in Beaufort County, we want to keep serving our customers. We want to keep serving the public, especially during these challenging times. And it takes tax revenue to do that. That is a is the majority, the largest line item in the revenue, um, revenue for revenue for these entities. So one, we are going to, the benefits of this program are our customers are going to get to pay in the calendar year. 
our online customers that prepay on my deeper county get their receipt right away so they can move forward with their income taxes or whatever they need to and we're going to begin collecting revenues for our agencies for our towns and our school districts the county our public service districts all the entities that are on your tax bills so that they can continue operating you this time of year is typically our lowest cash volume time. And we wanna make sure that we are not uh, avoiding any necessity of having to go into debt for these entities to operate. So this was a, a win-win all around having this prepayment program. And then ultimately, despite the ability to pay now, prepay now, our customers are still going to get to enjoy an extended payment deadline. So the challenges, because with just like with anything in life, there are pros and cons and benefits and challenges. The challenge in this situation is that because of the recalculation occurring in the auditor's office, uh, like I said, a lot of those resources in our software and our technology are, are being used by that process. I can't touch that software, that system to apply a payment two bills the auditor is currently recalculating. So the prepayments that we would be taking are going to accumulate. They will not be reflected in Aumentum. If anyone um, uses GovernMax or eGov to look up real property information, you'll know what I'm talking about. Those sys that system can't be touched by our office with a payment until the auditor has finished his process. So they will accumulate. It doesn't mean you don't get credit. It's just not going to be reflected until he's finished. Refunds will be limited during this time that he is working and ultimately delayed potentially. Why? Well, our refund process is managed and housed in the same software that the auditor's office is currently utilizing. If we can't apply a payment, we can't very well generate a, overpay, or a surplus that we can credit back to a customer. So there will or may be delays in getting those refunds back to our customers. Installment payments. I don't know how many installment payment uh, program participants we have on the call, but installment payments are held in escrow all year long. And they are that is the last step the treasurer's office performs before sending the bills. We take those installment payments and apply them to the billed amount that was calculated by the auditor's office. Once again, because the auditor's office is still calculating, recalculating the balances due, we have been unable to apply those installment payments to your bill. So if you are wanting to prepay and you go online, you are going to see the full balance due as if you didn't make any installment payment. I do not want you to pay that amount. And this is probably the only time I will say, just go ahead and reach out to my team. You can do that on our website or by giving us a call. And what you're going to do is let them know that you participate in the installment program. And, they, and you wanna know the remaining balance due on your account. They'll give you that information and you can mail us a check. Like I said, we'll honor your postmark date on your receipt and we'll send you that as soon as we're able to apply those payments in our software. So the highlights of, of what I've shared today is this is optional. You can prepay your 2020 taxes starting on Friday, preferably on mybeaufortcounty.com. And if you do not want to do that, you can certainly and are welcome to wait until you receive your bill, hopefully no later than the beginning of January. And at this time, I am absolutely happy to take questions, Mr. Miles, from any one of your members. Maria, thank you so much for that very informative presentation. And we do have a couple questions for you, and then we have the governor on mm -hmm. again. And uh, so we'll go to the governor after a few couple of questions here for Maria. And Maria, the first one's coming from Dave this morning. And Dave is asking, how do you find out what the estimate is? It's not an estimate. It is going to be the original balance due that the auditor calculated. And if you simply go to mybeaufortcounty.com on Friday, because this will begin on Friday, you will be able to see the amount due on your account. Okay, thank you for that answer. 
And then the next question is coming from Rob. And Rob is asking, how much is the convenience charge for online payments? So if you're paying by a check, there is no convenience fee and it's absolutely free. If you are paying by credit card, it is 2.5% of the total amount due. All right, thank you. The next and uh, final question I think that we have is from Jennifer. And Jennifer's asking, are the original tax bills on the website? The original tax bill. Um, Jennifer, if you're talking about our tax bill lookup where you can look up historical bills, no, they are not there yet. They, we generate that file and that lookup database after the bills have been mailed and generated. If you are looking for an e-bill type of format, you can certainly go to myzeforcounty.com on Friday and at least get a digital layout of what that bill would look like. Maria, that was so beneficial and thank you for taking time today and uh, uh, thank you for all the hard work you're doing and the explanations. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much and thank you for having me. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Maria. We'll talk soon. All right. That was Maria Walls and uh, a delight to have a Beaufort County treasurer. Uh, we're going to go back to the governor now. And governor, thank you for uh, uh, staying on with us this morning. And we know you have a few remarks you'd like to share. And we're just delighted to have you back with us again today. Governor, do we have you uh, connected? I know we had you a few minutes ago. And uh, can you hear we'll, me now, uh, Bill? There, there you are, Governor. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I sure do. Thank you for joining us today, Governor. Well, I'm uh, happy, happy to be with you again and listening to uh, Miss Maria talk there. It, re it just reminds me about how we've had such growth and prosperity in our state. And Hilton Head, of course, is a, a jewel for us. I remember the history starting back, well, the history goes way back when, uh, and that is the European part of the history of discovering the place. And then all the, uh, when the bridge, I can remember my parents talking about the bridge being built in 1956. And that's when things really took off with you know, Charles Frazier and, and others and I just I wanted to compliment everyone on a, a beautiful place there, and also Steve Riley, whom I understand is retiring. He's he's one of the one of the people that's made Hilton Head such a great place. You have to have steady leadership over the years. It's got to be consistent, and it has been. And I think of the great things that have happened at Hilton Head from the, the heritage and. All other things that the lighthouse I remember was built in sometime in the late 60s, and uh, people kind of laughed at it at first, but now it's become a, an international landmark. And I'm just proud to have a place like Hilton Head as a part of our great state. We got a lot of great places, and my hat's off to Steve Riley for his I think it's about 30 years of, of service as town manager and other things. We got a lot of talent in South Carolina, Bill. Some of us are born here. Some of us uh, get here as quick as we can from other places. But when you combine all the talent in South Carolina with the paradise we live in, we, we really are fortunate. And uh, one word on the virus, we are, as you know, we've, we've gotten the vaccines. We're beginning to get them. They're trickling in. Uh, there ought to be two to 300,000 doses by the end of the year. Uh, hats off to the Trump administration for pushing so hard to get the virus, the virus you know, there are three of them on the way, to get them all uh, made and invented and you know, going to be distributed. But we started with the distribution and the shots. But it's going to take a long time to get to everybody. We're starting with the hospital workers and those who treat the people that come in that are so sick. We must keep them, them healthy so they can take care of the rest of us, keep us alive and also in the nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And, Bill, I don't know if we'll have enough of the virus, those two to 300 uh, 
doses that are scheduled to be here before the end of the year will probably be not enough. They tell me to cover all of those people that are in the first group. But uh, we'll get there. We're making great progress. We never did close down the state like they did some other places. And as a result, I think we're, we're doing better. But I just want to, uh, again, congratulate Steve Riley on his tremendous service and everyone in, in Hilton Head for a lovely community there that has attracted world attention and really helped put South Carolina on the map. And also want to encourage everybody to, to look ahead, look through the virus. We've got a ways to go. We know how to we know how to protect ourselves. We need to keep on doing that. But the future is very bright for our state, and I look forward to, to being a part of it and Hilton Head being a part of it. And I'm uh, I'm very encouraged by our hopes for prosperity in the future. That's my message for right now, Bill. Governor, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, we appreciate those kind remarks and certainly about uh, uh, Steve Riley. And we want to wish you and uh, the First Lady a Merry Christmas. And again, thank you for, for your uh, support. You've, you've got a lot of rock stars in your administration, but there's been a couple that uh, have been with us really week after week. And I want to, while you're with us, want to certainly give a, a shout out to Dwayne Parrish and then also Dr. Jane Kelly, the Assistant State Epidemiologist with DHEC. Each of those uh, individuals have been with us just about week after week and sharing what's going on in their respective areas and have been a tremendous help uh, to our community. So, Governor, thanks for your leadership. Uh, give the First Lady our best and have a Merry Christmas. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, I certainly can't let the moment pass without uh, uh, following up on some of the Governor's comments there regarding our, our town manager, Steve Riley. And, and uh uh, and I know Steve's on the call today, and Steve, we just want to certainly say thank you and give a, a huge shout out to nearly 30 years of service to you. And, you know, I think back through all the years and the, the accomplish, accomplishments are certainly uh, too numerous to expand upon. But a couple of them, you know, we think back to Hurricane Matthew, and that was uh, a, a, a sad moment, but a, a moment in time that uh, uh, your leadership rose to the top again and uh, helped our community get back up and, and running again on its feet. And that was also the same year that you were awarded the John Curry Award for Tourism for the uh, uh, leadership that, that you demonstrated there. And then also, you know, you think back a little bit about the uh, RBC Heritage. And, um, you know, I remember how you stepped up to the plate uh, during that time of, of difficulty uh, when we were looking for a sponsor. And I guess maybe I should say you stepped up to the tee box and maybe uh, the plate as well. Uh, but anyway, your your support for, for that event throughout the years has, has been stellar. And those of you who might have been watching the till that town council meeting yesterday saw uh, uh, Steve Wilmot with Heritage Classic Foundation uh, present Steve virtually with the plaid jacket. It was a token of his uh, and the foundation's appreciation for all that Steve Riley has done for this community. And again, the uh, accomplishments are far too long to talk about on this call. But Steve, we thank you for your leadership, your support, your vision, and really your desire to never settle for anything less than excellence. And I think that speaks volume about you, it speaks volume about your administration, and uh, it speaks volumes about our region. So we salute you and thank you today. Uh, proud to call you a friend. And uh, we look forward to uh, many more great things for you to come in the very near future. So Steve, thanks again, congratulations. And we'll see you soon. And Steve, I don't know if you can see it or not, but I at least see it in my mind. Virtually, you're getting a standing ovation from all the uh, all the listeners on the call today, as well as those who are watching on the Beaufort County channel and those who are, are on social media. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Governor, for being with us. And we're going to move on to our next speaker, and that's uh, Dr. Jane Kelly. And as we mentioned to the governor, that she's provided a wealth of great information throughout 2024 so on our teletown halls. She's helped keep us informed, helped keep us safe, and offered facts over fear for all of our listeners and our community. And uh, Dr. Kelly, welcome back to the call. We're looking forward to your insight again today, and uh, we appreciate you keeping our community informed. 
Well, great. Thank you very much for inviting me back. I, I, you know, as I've said every week, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy listening to the other speakers. And you guys help me organize my thoughts about communication, not just with you all, but with the, with the public. And I'm very aware that uh, you all are trusted voices in your communities as well. So the more I can get accurate information to you, the better it gets disseminated further out to the rest of the community. Uh, I do want to begin with a couple of comments about influenza because it is influenza season as well. We've talked about this before that a combination of COVID-19 influenza co-infection would be a, a bad deal, but I've got good news here. And that this, is, this figure is showing influenza-like activity, um, which is a way that we measure kind of the background noise of, of influenza. There are a number of different ways that we statistically examine this, um, but the uh, the methodology remains the same year to year, so we can compare how we are doing in terms of influenza this year compared to previous years. Uh, green bars are good, means minimal activity. Uh, the darker blue mean high influenza activity. And this time last year, we had high influenza activity. So uh, the question has occurred, we've talked about this also before, uh, do the mitigation measures, wearing masks, uh, avoiding large crowds, distancing, washing hands, are they making an impact for influenza? It looks like it, they are, and that, that is good news. That said, I would still urge people to get your flu shot if you haven't already gotten your flu shot. Here's our, our statistics update, trend in new COVID-19 cases in South Carolina. Uh, the number of cases, deaths, and hospitalizations uh, continue to increase. This is true throughout the country, uh, and it worries, worries us even more with Christmas coming up. Um, but let's dive into this a little bit more. Um, this is the, the uh, trend line for the United States as a whole. Uh, let's look more closely at what's going on in terms of the numbers, including Beaufort County. So the United States as a whole over the past seven days has added 1.6 million new cases of COVID-19 and 17,000 new deaths. In South Carolina, we've had 36, over 36,000 new cases in the last seven days uh, and over 500 new deaths. Um, and these are confirmed, not probable. Beaufort County, total cases is almost 8,000, added 500 new cases in the past seven days and three new deaths. I want to look at these statistics in, in a different, highlight a different matter. We keep talking about bed occupancy, hospital occupancy in South Carolina and the fact that we are not currently overwhelmed. We are having more and more uh, uh, patients presenting with suspect or confirmed COVID. Uh, most places around the state are not overwhelmed in terms of bed occupancy. However, do you know what a locum tenens ICU nurse makes per hour right now? We've got staffing shortages. This is not just a matter of hospital beds. I am hearing uh, that um, contract nurses who are, you know, the itinerant nurses are getting up to $150 an hour to work with COVID-19 patients. So there is a, definitely a crisis uh, imminent in terms of being able to take care of patients in hospital settings. South Carolina is better off than the rest of the state and Beaufort County is better off than much of the, excuse me, South Carolina is better off than most of the United States. Beaufort County is better off than most of the counties in South Carolina, but I just continue to urge people uh, to, to be careful and keep on keeping on. We are at that red arrow in this phase COVID-19 vaccine allocation. The Pfizer vaccine has arrived in South Carolina. It's being rolled out in hospital settings. Uh, the Moderna vaccine we hope will be approved this week. Uh, and if it is approved for emergency use authorization, we anticipate getting it Christmas week and can begin vaccinating people in long-term care facilities as well. Uh, as we get more Doses of vaccine will be able to roll that out to other populations, but this is definitely a, a supply and demand issue that uh, we are we will receive weekly allocations, but we don't know how much vaccine hesitancy there is out there. So we're not certain what's going to go on from the demand chain point of view. 
we've talked about this before, but I just want to remind people, the Pfizer vaccine, the new one that's, that's out, uh, does cause mild to moderate pain at the injection site in most people. And by that, I mean not for weeks at a time, I mean for one day. Uh, and that there are no serious adverse events. But I think as we start to have uh, workers in healthcare settings around the state and people in long-term care facilities receive this vaccine, we're gonna hear more discussion about people saying, wow, after that second dose of vaccine, or wow, after that first dose of vaccine, that knocked me for a loop. I'm not sure if I want to get the second dose. And that worries me because the vaccine, neither Pfizer nor Moderna are fully efficacious. They won't fully protect you unless you get the booster dose. A single, a single dose of vaccine is a wasted dose of vaccine. This is a complicated figure, but I've included it for a reason. This is out of the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is around the Pfizer vaccine. I've got those red ovals around the number of people who reported having mild to moderate pain at the injection site, and it's broken down by age as well. The older adults over age 55 had reported less pain at the injection site. Even with the second dose, only two thirds of them had mild and a small number uh, of moderate pain at the injection site. I also wanna to point to the other two symptoms that were reported most frequently, and those are fatigue and headache. So if you just look at the top figure, the top graph, this is age 16 to 55, 47% reported fatigue with their first injection of the Pfizer vaccine, but 33% of the people who received placebo reported fatigue as well. So while I, I want to be clear that there are some uh, temporary symptoms associated with vaccination, uh, I, I don't want people to overemphasize or worry, uh, you know, unduly concerned about them. More than half of people reported no fatigue. So, uh, you know, more than half reported no headache. Um, so not, not to overspeak the, uh, the vaccine um, temporary symptomatology. Uh, it, it is about, in terms of symptoms that people experience, it's like halfway between the influenza vaccine and the new shingles vaccine in terms of the symptoms it produces. Um, people have asked me about contraindications. The only contraindication to receiving this vaccine is allergy to any of the vaccine components. Now I put this slide in kind of being a little facetious because I can't even pronounce some of these vaccine components, but let me try and break it down a little bit more into normal English because people are asking, what's in this vaccine? What about adjuvant? Does it have mercury? Um, here are the ingredients. There's the active ingredient of this messenger RNA. We've talked a lot about that in the past. And then it's coated with four lipids. The reason for that is so that the body doesn't just break down that messenger RNA as soon as it's injected. It's protected until it can get inside the cell. Those four lipids or fats include polyethylene glycol. And polyethylene glycol is probably the one most likely to cause symptoms or an allergic reaction. This is a very common compound in, in a lot of over-the-counter laxatives. And it's also the one that is used in the most common bowel prep for colonoscopy. Um, so that's the one that people might be allergic to. Otherwise, the ingredients are some salts to keep it to buffer the pH and some sugar so it doesn't all stick together. Uh, but there's no mercury, no antibiotics, and no preservatives in this vaccine. There are always going to be some people who refuse all vaccines. Uh, I, I bring this conversation to you because this conversation begins with all of us. People are going to are at look to you for any information you might have about vaccine. Uh, I think the answer to vaccine hesitancy is information, not reassurance, to not just tell people, don't worry, it's been proven safe. It's rather to encourage people to look at the information themselves and make a decision. What's my personal risk for getting COVID-19? What would happen to me if I got COVID-19? Would I become severely ill? Or I think I probably just have mild illness, or am I worried about I'm going to transmit it to my grandmother? Compare that to what we know about the vaccine. You know, where do you turn for information? You know, I turn to peer review scientific journal articles. So I read a news article that's reporting something. I want to see the link to, you know, the original source. Uh, and if they don't provide that link, I think that's a red flag. It's just a rumor. 
Um, it, it, and I hold the same thing true for social media. Social media, somebody puts out a claim that this vaccine contains, uh, changes your DNA, or it is lowering fertility levels. I want to know, where did you get that information? I mean, maybe there's, maybe there's some credibility to it. So any claims that I'm seeing in newspaper or social media, I want to know, where did you get that information? If they can only link me to another blog or social media site, that's not very credible. There ought to be data out there. You want credible peer reviewed article, even if you can't read all the, the statistics or the jargon, the scientific jargon that's in the article, you wanna know that this is published data, not just a rumor. All right, our recurrent theme of do masks really work? Uh, this was a study in Mississippi and this is good news. This has to do with school safety because schools have really pulled out the stops with trying to make the school situation a safe environment. This study in Mississippi compared children who tested negative for the virus versus those who tested positive. And those who tested positive were more likely to have attended weddings, parties, funerals, play dates in the two weeks before their positive test. They were not more likely to have attended childcare or school in person. So this is comparing kids who were uh, in school virtually versus in school in person. The school setting itself is not, was not associated with positive uh, tests. So masks and distancing, washing hands, they work. Um, I've had some questions recently about uh, which mask is best. And I just want to uh, encourage people to recognize that Two layers is better than one. One is really inadequate. It gets moist from your breathing in and out. And certainly if there is a droplet that's going to stick to that first, that to a single layer of mask, it can easily go through that. Better to have two, even better would be three layers of masks of different materials because it's not just a physical barrier. There's also an electrostatic filtration. So the ideal mask would be cotton and silk or nylon. Personally, I have a mask that has like a little inner pocket. It's got two layers of cotton, but it's got an inner layer pocket that I can put in just a piece of silk or nylon to set up that electrostatic charge. Masks also help avert shutdowns. We, you know, we don't want this happening here. So, you know, cloth masks reduce community exposure, both you know, source control, meaning you infecting somebody else, but they also work in personal protection. I mean, look at the school example. I think that that is really telling. Um, and the universal, the places that have had universal masking policies uh, have had fewer shutdowns. They've had fewer cases of COVID-19 and fewer shutdowns. So I've gone through that pretty quickly, but as once again, thank you for inviting me. There's my email if you need to contact me uh, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, Dr. Kelly, thank you once again for uh, that uh, wealth of information. Uh, first, uh, the first one is simply a comment coming from Jennifer and Jennifer is saying, just please share with Dr. Kelly that uh, her presentations are very, very important to us each week and then thanking you for doing that. Our, uh, our first question is coming to us from James and uh, James is asking about if there is still a need to wear masks after getting vaccinated? Very important question. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, and for several reasons. First of all, with the first dose, there, there may be some level of protection, but remember it's not really been studied for what level of protection after the first dose. So after the first dose, I would not consider you protected. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't take the risk. Even after the second dose, yes, both Pfizer and Moderna have been shown to be 95% efficacious. But that means for 5% of people, the vaccine does not take, so to speak. It does not have the desired result. Uh, it, for some people, it may be because they, are, they have a medical condition, they're immunocompromised, or they're on prednisone. There, there may be some reasons for some people. But for other people in those phase three studies, they could not identify why the vaccine did not work for them. So I would play it safe with continuing to wear a mask until most of society is vaccinated and we start to see the number of new cases go down because you don't know for your personal risk whether you might get infected, but also if you got, if you were one of those, that unlucky 5%, maybe you would only have mild disease, so mild you didn't even know it, 
and the vaccine helped prevent severe disease, but you were contagious and might spread it to other people who haven't been vaccinated yet. yet. So, you know, the, the return to norm is coming, but it's going to take months. Okay, thank you for that answer. Next question is coming from David. And David is asking, do current COVID positive patients need the vaccine? Yes. So you don't want to give this vaccine while someone is acutely ill with COVID-19. But someone who has had COVID-19 and recovered, the vaccine is recommended for them because the level of antibodies produced by the vaccine are, is higher and lasts longer than what we have seen in convalescent serum in people who have recovered from the disease. So yes, if you have had the disease, you should still be vaccinated. Okay, thank you for that answer. And the next question is from Margaret, and Margaret is asking, how does, how does someone tell the difference between a cold or flu and COVID? Should you get tested with any symptoms? You, unfortunately, it is very difficult to distinguish a cold or the flu from COVID-19. There is a lot of overlap in symptoms. So I, and we've got a lot of community transmission going on right now. So I would play it safe. If you have any symptoms and you think, oh, this is probably just a cold, it might not be. And there's, there, there's, an, there's several reasons to get tested with some symptoms. Among them are the fact that there is now a new treatment if you are infected and it's very early on in your, the course of disease with these monoclonal antibodies. They won't give them to you if you're farther along in disease. So if you have some symptoms, you're uncertain, I would encourage it's easier now, easier now than ever to uh, be tested. It is no longer the long Q-tip swab that you know goes way into your nose. It's just swabbing in the first uh, half inch of your nose. It, it is an easier test and I would encourage people to any symptoms at all to get tested, both to protect themselves, protect others, and also because you might be eligible to get those monoclonal antibodies. Dr. Kelly, thank you. That uh, concludes our questions this morning. Again, we thank you for being with us and look forward to uh, you rejoining us after the first of the year. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great holiday. Thank you, you too. All right. All right. That was Dr. Jane Kelly from DHEC. And the uh, next speaker, before we get to our special guest, uh, certainly our next speaker is special as well, um, but also uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, update on small business and what's happening to help support the business community financially as we move through the pandemic. And I'm pleased to welcome Greg White. And Greg's been with us before. And if you remember, he's the district director of the Small Business Administration for South Carolina's district office. Greg, welcome back and thank you for joining us today. Bill, thank you for having us. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your uh, chamber and the uh, give some update on the information for the Small Business Administration. The focus that we have right now is on forgiveness and fraud. We're uh, starting to get several applications for the uh, uh, loan forgiveness from banks and borrowers uh, to submit at SBA. They are being processed. Some individuals and lenders are recommending that you uh, do not process your forgiveness applications right now because of the um, pending legislation with Congress and there may be some additional funding from uh, Congress for PPP down the road, but I would encourage you if you've got an existing loan out there to go ahead and start with the forgiveness process. As far as the fraud aspect, we've had several, as you would during the holiday season, scams and fraud uh, applications. Uh, if you do encounter that, please contact my office. We will put you in contact with the proper methodology to get this corrected or addressed. So please do not hesitate to contact us if there is fraud. I want to encourage everybody, if you were part of the economic injury and disaster loan process, the, the uh, normal disaster loans for the COVID, that process for the COVID designation ends on uh, December the 21st. Now there is a extension of that to the 31st for reconsiderations and uh, uh, to look at the loans again. So if you're, you're considering put in for an economic injury uh, loan, please go ahead and do so before the 21st. Uh, Congress will, uh, res continuing resolution will end on this Friday, the 18th. Uh, we do know that they are in close discussions, the Senate and the House, and the two parties are close to coming up to, with a, um, some type of bill. Uh, if not, we will shut down on Friday as far as operations. 
there is indications that will be an extension of the PPP program. Uh, looks like about a 300 million, uh, excuse me, 300 billion dollar um, funding toward SBA for additional PPP loans and and management. Don't have any indication on extension of the EIDL or any uh, economic injury and disaster loan grants at this point. Uh, mainly, it would be looking at the operation and continue of the uh, PPP program. Would like to encourage everybody if. Um, as we come out of this COVID crisis to go ahead and prepare. We see signs of economic recovery right now. So we'd like to encourage uh, all our small businesses to go ahead and start preparing for the recovery. Uh, it's, it's a growth opportunity for some of our small businesses. And we have counselors at Small Business Development Center, SCORE chapters and our women business centers across the state to provide counseling for this preparation. And they also help with the applications as far as uh, supply uh, applying for the forgiveness for the PPP loans and EIDL loan applications. The um, other thing I'd like to encourage uh, is to support our small businesses in the state. The, um, they need your support. Uh, this is a uh, small businesses are the heart of our economy, creating in South Carolina at least 50% of the jobs, if not more. Uh, you can help a small business by purchasing online buying gift cards, doing takeout, whatever, whatever methodology you can use. But I would just encourage you to continue to support our small, small businesses. Uh, the only disaster beside the COVID that we have outstanding right now is our civil disobedience out of Charleston, which happened this past uh, fall. That's the only other outstanding uh, civil disobedience or uh, disaster declaration we have for the state. Other than that, our normal programs, our, our 7A guaranteed loan programs, our 504 uh, fixed asset program, and our microloan programs are still available. Uh, we have a lot of interest in our contracting programs at this time, our federal contracting program. So any interest in any of our programs, please feel free to contact us and let me know if you have any questions. You can call our office at 765-5377. Uh, That's 803-765-5377. And we'll be glad to uh, assist in any of our programs that we can. And I'll be glad to answer any questions, Bill. All right, Greg, thank you. The first question we have, does the SBA expect any additional relief coming out of DC for small businesses? And that's coming to us from Rick this morning. We're waiting on Congress. I know they're in negotiations right now. Um, Everything we have runs out pretty much on the 31st of uh, 21st of uh, December, unless Congress uh, continues to act or does something by the 18th. So there is nothing new other than our normal programs uh, until Congress passes something. Uh, be glad, feel free to contact your congressman and express your interest in uh, encouraging them to uh, fund some type of programs to help these small businesses. All right, Greg, we have another one that uh, John is asking uh, for an email address for uh, to be able to email someone in, in uh, your office with a question. You can email me at richard.white at sba.gov, and I will make sure someone in my office gets in contact with you. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we've posted that. So you've got his uh, uh, email address there. And we appreciate you being with us again today. And again, uh, uh, thanks for all that the SBA does. And we look forward to, again, talking with you as well after the first of the year. Uh, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. All right. Have a great holiday. Merry Christmas to you and a happy holiday. Thank you. All right. So for our final guest this morning, uh, certainly are coming to us from a, a long, long, long way away. And... Uh, uh, actually, they live about 4,000 miles from here, and they're <laughs> extremely busy at this time of year with their global operations, and, you know, we're talking small business and all things business, so I wanted you to also know they've recently been contacted by a number of companies for consulting work to find out just how they're able to deliver packages so successfully to every household on the planet in a single evening, and uh, we're fortunate they could be with us this morning, and please welcome... Uh, uh, Santa and, and Mrs. Claus. Ho, 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 ho. Merry Christmas from Santa and Mrs. Claus. We also wish you a happy Hanukkah and a 2021 New Year. 
where the COVID goes away and our economy prospers. And this year of all years, remember to find local. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Shannon and Mrs. Claus, thank you all. And uh, I know you've got a, a busy, busy time ahead of you. And uh, remember that uh, all the goodness of people in the in the low country. <laughs> will do. Will. All right. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to conclude it for uh, our call today and our calls for 2020. We thank you for joining us. It's a delight to have uh, Santa and Mrs. Claus with us as well as we wrap up uh, as we wrap up this call today. So, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah and uh, have a terrific end of the year, and we'll be back with you in the new year. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.